What's up everyone, excited to give this video today about a firm which just had its stock cut from a neutral rating to an underweight rating by Piper Standler, which is a very respected firm throughout Wall Street. So this is sending shares lower. Obviously, the general market is lower today, which is definitely exacerbating this, this move lower off this news. But really, the reason we're seeing this, this cut today is because um, the firm the company said the firm has increasingly held loans on its balance sheet as higher rates and wider credit spreads pressured pricing in the whole loan market. So it's basically a general call that loaning activity will continue to dip as rates continue to rise. So, you know, th this isn't the best sign for the stock, but at the end of the day, it's one company making a one opinion. So I, I, I don't think it's the end all be all. And I think the reaction of, you know, shares down at almost 16% right now is a little strong. Um, so, so that's kind of my opinion on the news. First off, this is not financial advice, so please do your own research in D&D. In this video, I will cover the chart, give a price prediction on shares. Then I will go into short interest. I'll go over some fundamentals for the stock. Then I'll go into financials. And at the very end, I will compare these financials to some other competitors such as SoFi and Upstart. So with that being said, let's take a peek at the chart. So we're coming down to test this 200 day moving average, which coincides with the 50 DMA moving average. And we also have some support at the 100 day moving average. Um, and this is really where shares are currently right now. They're basically sitting at that 100 day moving average. Um, for my money, what I'm thinking is I believe this these moving averages will likely lead to a firm holding and moving higher over the coming days to weeks, barring any massive drop throughout the market, right? Um, so I think shares likely hold this general level from about $12.90 to about $13, bucks, um, $13.50 ish. I, I think we hold this level and continue higher over the coming weeks. And one reason for that is actually just today, believe it or not, we had the 50-day moving average cross above the 200-day moving average, which for those that don't, that don't know, is a sign of bullish momentum and is called a golden cross. This is by far the most watched daily moving average signal. Obviously, we traded below these DMAs um, you know, after the, the um, downgrade from Piper Sandler, but I think long-term or, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we will likely see that this level holds for a firm and we get a larger move higher over the coming weeks. So that's kind of my prediction for a firm. And in terms of where we could top out, well, it does look as if this $22 level is pretty significant resistance. It's where shares had topped out in November of 2022. It's also where shares had topped out to start the year in February of 2023. So therefore, I believe this level continues to hold and we see um, a move higher up to this level. Um, let's say we broke that crucial level. Um, well, that, then I think shares would likely continue higher to about $31. And, you know, really my short term price prediction is that we hold these DMAs and continue higher. Um, so with that being said, that's my price prediction for shares. We hold these DMAs. If let's say I'm wrong, the market rolls over, whatever it may be, we have major support at about $8.70, which is where shares had bottomed in May. It's also where shares had bottomed in December as well as March. So if these DMAs don't hold, I see this kind of being the next level we find some support for shares. But my official prediction is we hold these DMAs and continue higher. So that is my prediction for firm. Let's take a look at short interest here. So as a percent of float, 20% of the float is sold short, which is pretty is, is a pretty high number um, for the general market. And then in terms of days to cover, which kind of shows us how likely how likely a short squeeze is, we see days to cover at 2.6. And for those that don't know, that basically means that it takes 2.6 days of average volume to cover the amount of shares that are sold short right now. So 2.6, not really a very high number, but um, you know, it's 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 not under one, which which um, you know would I would give the stock about an F in, in terms of a short 
uh, you know, squeeze possibility. For the 2.6 number, I would give this a possible short squeeze rating of, you know, D minus D, um, just because two, like, what we typically look for for days to cover is a days to cover of 10. That typically demonstrates a high likelihood of a short squeeze. So having days to cover at 2.6, you know, we're only 25% of the way there to 10. So I can't, in in good conscience, um, give this stock a high likelihood of a short squeeze. It just doesn't make sense when you look at the numbers. And then let's take a look at some of the fundamentals of the company. So this is an article by Lewis Stevens on Seeking Alpha. So he says, eventually the Fed will stop its aggressive operations that serve that serve to suppress financial activity in the U.S. economy and globally. The yield cur- curve will uninvert and a firm will once again resume the hyper growth to which it was accustomed to prior to 2022. A firm CEO, Mark Levitch, is only 47 years old. And it's very interesting. He, has a, he definitely has some great experience within the fintech space. He actually was the founder of PayPal's and, you know, he actually built that company with Elon Musk. So pretty cool there. He definitely has some experience in this kind of growthy fintech company. So this is definitely up his alley. And and I do have firm confidence in the management for this company. And this was interesting, too. So when we look at this is from a firm's Q1 earnings presentation, we can see that revenue has been been growing, but really more interestingly is that expenses have been coming down significantly. So sales and marketing have dropped a lot. Technology and data dropped a lot. Uh, general and administrative ed, ed, administrative costs, excuse me, have dropped as well. So when you have a um, company. Um, that is investing heavily in its business, its 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 growth. Um, you always see these costs, you know, kind of look like a like a like a rocket ship. But we've seen those costs taper off over the past couple quarters, which to me signals that the company doesn't feel like it has to continue to invest massively in growth to move towards profitability. And we'll get in, into those profitability and growth numbers a little more granularly later in the video um, once we cover financials. But this was interesting too. So a firm spent $16 million to acquire 400,000 customers in Q1 of 2023, where SoFi actually spent $175 million to acquire 400,000 customers in Q1 of 2023. So that just shows you that a firm, it's it, it, it's a lot easier for a firm to kind of garner attention and c- customer interest relative to um, SoFi here. So, like to see that. And then, um, like he said earlier in this report, a firm's credit products are specifically priced on the shorter end of the curve. Um, so, eventually in the next 12 to 24 months, the shorter end of the curve will fall to roughly where it where it was, um, which is the blue line, and a firm's growth and profitability will improve. So the two-year uh, yield actually hit a new high just today. So we're seeing these short-term rates kind of skyrocket on the backs of um, bullish um, jobs data, or I, I shouldn't say bullish, really uh, hot, hotter than expected jobs data, more jobs being created than was originally expected. And this kind of makes the Fed's job harder, right? Because when the when the economy is humming, it's it's tough to say that interest rates have really started to take effect yet, which in theory could force the Fed to continue to move rates higher. But, um, you know, we, we will kind of see how that plays out. But I, I would definitely agree with the statement that over the next two years, um, the short end of the curve, the one year, the two year treasury yields should continue to fall, which should help a, a firm which has a significant amount of their credit pro- products priced on the shorter end of the curve, not the 10 year, right? So that is a good thing to see. And then a firm has truly gargantuan cash hoard of $2.9 billion alongside $1 billion in a 0% coupon convertible debt due in November of 2026, which is a long time out. And then 
A firm faces hurdles related to the fastest repricing of credit in American history, as we've seen in the inverted yield, yield curve, but this will abate and the yield, yield, excuse me, the yield curve will uninvert eventually. So, um, you know, definitely the, the biggest, um, you know, worry and concern is the Fed and what, you know, that entity, you know, does with rates. So if the Fed is, is, if the Fed continues to slow interest rates and help stimulate the economy, um, well, that would be a good thing for a firm. And that is definitely expected from economists around the world. So, um, you know, hoping that that expectation becomes reality soon. So with that being said, let's take a look at some of the financials for the company. So for those that don't know, this is Seeking Alpha. It basically puts all these factor grades relative um, to the peers. So relative to the peers, Seeking Alpha is giving a D grade in terms of valuation. And let's break down some of these numbers to explain why. So EBITDA sales is... 5.4 compared to the sector median of three times, which is not the best number, but is what it is there. And then price to book ratio is 1.9 compared to the sector median of 0.95. Um, and that is, <clears throat> for those that don't know, price to book ratio just puts the market cap relative to the assets on its balance sheet. So in this case, a firm, their market cap is 1.9 times the assets on its balance sheet. So not the best number there, but definitely pretty solid, especially for a company that is growing at, at the rate that they are growing. Speaking of growth, let's take a look at some numbers here. So anytime you see a company that has, you know, pretty high valuations, trading at a high valuations, investors are paying up for their for the future earnings of the company, you always want to see growth rationalize those high valuations investors are paying. And we're definitely seeing that here with a firm. So year over year growth is 20% for a, a firm. And then over the past, excuse me, over the next 12 months, re revenue growth is expected to be 29%. So we're expecting a 9% increase over the next 12 months in terms of growth. And then this is good because it actually goes against the sector median. So growth is slowing throughout the entire sector, but we're seeing um, some divergence with a firm, which to me tells me that this company, their their growth metrics are not being hindered by the same factors that are, um, you know, kind of bogging down the general sector's growth metrics. So awesome to, to see that there. And we're definitely seeing growth rationalize that valuation, which is what we always want to see. So good to see there. And then let's take a look at some profitability numbers here. So Gross profit margin is 45%. And for those that don't know, gross profit margin just tells you what you make every time you sell something. So um, it's basically just revenue minus cost of goods sold, which is good to see there. 45 isn't horrible, <clears throat> but it is below the sector median of 58. So um, worth noting there. And then in terms of that cash per share, we have $3.30 per share in cash. That's about 10% uh, of the market cap in cash. So Love to see that there. That definitely gives the company, um, you know, some stability. Um, and then when we take a look at net income, net income margin, we see that the company is at a negative sixty four percent net income margin compared to the sector median of twenty five point eight. So, um, you know, definitely, definitely, um, you know, not great when you compare it to the sector median, but. When we look at cash per share and gross profit margin, I would say overall the profitability grade is pretty solid for this company. And then let's take a look at how the stock stacks up to the close peers. So I just compared the stock to Square, Upstart, and SoFi. As you can see, a firm is the worst performing stock for the year when, when you compare it to the peers. And then when we take a look at um, some PE numbers, you can see that the company doesn't make money. Obviously, neither does Upstart or SoFi. But for the next year, we're seeing PE um, definitely, it's still negative, but it outpaces the PE for SoFi, which we like to see. And then price to book ratio is 1.18, which ranks out pretty well compared to the, the peers with Square at 2.3. 5.1 and then 1.5 for SoFi. For those that, that don't know, the lower the, the lower this number is, the better really. 
Um, so we're seeing SoFi rank out as number one there. And then in terms of revenue growth, we're seeing a firm um, beat Square on revenue growth and Upstart on revenue growth. And Upstart is negative actually for revenue growth, just as an FYI. But SoFi is still taking the cake there with the best revenue growth numbers. Um, and then gross profit margin ranks out decent. So we're better than Square. And then a firm is worse than Upstart and SoFi. SoFi has some really good margins. I've, I've covered SoFi in a, in a couple other videos. Um, so, so SoFi's margins is you know one of the best um, financial metrics uh, for for the stock for sure. And then um, we can see insider shares. I always like to take a look at this because this kind of sh um, will give the price and some stability. So. If a significant amount of insiders, you know, the CEO, the C-suite, the, the employees at the company hold shares, well, all that does is it forces, um, it basically forces those employees to hold because they have to disclose when they sell one and there's restrictions on how much they can hold, I mean, how much they can sell, when they can sell. So this is basically just making um, the shareholder base somewhat sticky. So for a firm, we have almost 7% of the company, um, you know, be um, insiders. Um, and then we have 10% for S Square and then 14% of the company at Upstart, 14% um, of the market cap is owned by employees. So, um, you know, it doesn't rank out super well, but still 6.8% is definitely a lot when you look at the general market. And then what do we look like in terms of short interest? So 20% of the float is sold short for a firm, which is well below Square, below Square and is basically in line with SoFi, but well below Upstart. Um, so interesting there. Oh, and, and I think I may have said this wrong. Um, Square is well below um, a firm in terms of short interest, and Upstart is well above a firm in, ter in terms of short interest. Um, and then... We can see here, um, look at book value per share. So th this is like book value for those that don't know is basically what is on the company's balance sheet. So that's equipment, cash, um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so $8 of book value per share is pretty good. Um, it's lower than Square at $28 per share, but it also beats SoFi and Upstart in terms of book value per share. So I do like to see that. And then let's take a look at some EPS revisions. So for those that don't know, um, analysts will basically put out their EPS and revenue expectations and change those expectations um, based on company specific news, general market news, news on the consumer, basically anything that would affect these numbers. So it's a good thing to watch because it shows you what Wall Street is thinking about the stock. So for a firm, we've seen um, two up revisions for EPS and two down revisions for EPS, so basically a wash there. And then for revenue, though, we've seen um, 13 up revisions compared to one down revision. So net-net, for a firm, investors are becoming more and more bullish. And we've seen um, Square um, for, for Square, investors become more and more bearish on EPS, but become more bullish on um, revenue expectations. And then for Upstart, we've seen investors become more bullish on EPS and more bullish on revenue. So Upstart is kind of the blowout number here in terms of, um, you know, recent changes in Wall Street's expectations. And then when we look at SoFi, SoFi has two up revisions to zero down revisions for EPS. And then when we look at revenue revisions, we see six up revisions compared to two down revisions for the company. So overall, a firm is basically in line with the peers in terms of um, Wall Street expectations, but generally you could say that the entire sector has seen an increase in their EPS and revenue expectations as Wall Street has become more and more bullish on the stock. Interesting too here, we can see this shows you the amount of EPS beats in the past two years. So as you can see, um, a firm actually ranks out as one of the as the worst amongst the peers in terms of beating EPS, but it ranks out as the second best in terms of beating revenue. So you know, a, a, about middle of the pack there, in terms of the the best, um, you know, 
history with um, re reporting uh, EPS and revenue beats, it would be SoFi. SoFi actually has a history of beating expectations um, at a higher clip than the peers. So that was a lot. Obviously, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's kind of like drinking from a from a fire hose with all this this info. So feel free to you know go back and review some stuff. But with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll leave it there. Have a good day. If you got some value from this video, please leave a like. We post company breakdowns and important market moving news on this channel on a daily basis, so make sure you are subscribed. If you would like to receive my daily portfolio moves, my exits, my entries, and see how me and my team of analysts are trading the markets, join the Discord through the link in the description below to get our free 7-day trial. Also, if you would like to join our free daily newsletter, sign up to our Substack, which is linked below as well. With that being said, good luck, everyone. Happy trading. Happy investing.